Please welcome Martin Casado. Great, thank you. Thank you. So I'm just, uh, I'm just uh, gonna kick off the panel of intent-based networking. I just wanna say a couple of things. So I think when I kind of got, got into networking, I come from a distributed systems background, was in um, so around 2000, so 17 years ago or so. And, and as you know, like when, when networks originally evolved, the problem that was being focused on was organic growth at scale of connectivity, which is a hard problem. I mean, and we were like myopically focused on that very difficult problem, but that problem was all about like what are the endpoints, how do you scale, you know, and so it was basically IP addresses and eventual consistency and routing protocols and so forth. And that pervaded the way that we thought about networking for a long time. And, and that changed, I would say, around the 2003-ish time frame, and certainly for my thinking, um, it changed when I read a paper called Triad. And so, you know, we're currently in the, the intent-based networking, which it's not super clear to me um, what that means from a very high level, but it is clear to me that once we've evolved abstractions from these low-level primitives, we can actually start throwing things like programming languages at this problem and start thinking about higher-level concepts. And so, I'm actually very honored to be introducing Dr. Cheriton to the stage to be the first person to talk because in my personal arc, when I read Triad, which was actually his work, and if you haven't read the work on Triad, I recommend you do it, you know, Dr. Cheriton actually comes from a distributed systems background. He posed this fundamental question, which is like basically IP addresses mean nothing. What are we building networks for? What have we had higher level abstractions? And you know, this was kind of an earlier work which predated all of this kind of SDN mania. Um, but I know it's very formative to me. So with that, I'm very happy in order to introduce Dr. Cheriton to the, to the stage. So with that, please uh, help me welcome him. I, ha I have the clicker. You do have the clicker, okay, good. All right, here you go. Good, all right. I think of Martine when I think of my rule of always be nice to your graduate students because you never know what they'll end up doing. <laughs> uh, I've had some become DARPA program managers and everything. So <clears throat> I'm going to talk about intent-based networking and I guess the transformation to uh, vendor agnostic intent-based networking. So. Uh, just to start out and level set us here, your network is clearly your digital foundation. It's the basis on which everything runs and it's not just a collection of devices and cables and it has to deliver highly reliable, high performance, low latency controlled connectivity and coordinating with policies and compliance regulations and it has to do this 24 by seven. You know, it's kind of like running a super complicated LA freeway network where the cars are traveling close to the speed of light and you're not supposed to have any congestion or accidents. And so it's, frightening, I think, because a sick network means a sick business when you do this digital transformation because everything's sitting on, on a network. So I claim we need to operate this network like our livelihood depends on it because it actually does. Um, so how do we program this foundation? Well, I claim we program it like the 1960s. And for those of you who weren't born then, the 1960s was actually a long time ago before cell phones and internet and all sorts of stuff we take for granted. And back then we programmed an assembly language. If you look at the current CLI, it basically is an assembly language. It's low level, it's error prone, and sort of inscrutable, plus kicker on top of it is it tends to be vendor specific just like machine language was way back when. But it gets worse than just what we did with assembly language bec whoops, because, um, because each switch can be, needs to be programmed consistently. We're not just programming individual separate applications. We're programming a bunch of these devices that have to work together. Plus we provide the ability for the operator to go in necessarily and sometimes change switch configs at any point. Plus what we experience is the really bad things in networks is they don't tend to go down. They tend to just act poorly and your job is still on the line but it makes it very hard to debug something that's not completely down, it's just behaving kind of badly. So what we have is a low level complex manual programming of a business critical distributed platform and I try to think well how could it get any worse than that? <clears throat> So networking missed out, I claim, on this evolution to high-level programming, because if I look back in the 1960s, I'm 
was there for some of this, that we were programmed an assembly language and we were telling the thing exactly how to do everything. Put this value in this register, set this interface to on. You know, we're doing all this stuff explicitly. In the 1970s and 80s, the rest of programming world moved up to these higher level languages like C and C++ that start saying, give me objects, give me, you know, take care of the register allocation, figure out how to ha res handle the resources of the machine yourself. And in the 1990s and 2000s, we moved into even higher level language. And I think SQL is an interesting case where you don't say, tell the thing how to find data that you're after. You just say, this is what I want. This is what I want, and it figures out how to do this. So in these higher level uh, abstractions, you're able to have application specific semantics, meaning, or intent. And the wonderful thing here in the rest of programming is there's less to write, it's easier to read, there's more automatic error checking because you system knows what you're specifying, and guess what? You're operating at this higher level, so it's portable across different vendors. So you see people are writing software that runs on a variety of different architectures in the rest of the computing world, and we're not doing this in networking. So what about network programming? Well, I think we got left behind somehow. We got locked into this manual CLI level programming, and what have we done so far? Well, we have scripts and templates sort of thing that generate vendor-specific CLI commands across the network, but the trouble is that this amplifies risk because you go from being able to tell one switch the wrong thing to being able to tell a whole flock of switches the wrong thing at the same time. And the key problem here is that the scripts don't understand semantics. They're really just operating at a syntactic level, you know, regex sort of matching of things. They don't know your intent. And also, of course, it isn't good enough to just say I told the network the right thing. You want to make sure that it continues to do the right thing. And so there's no runtime checking as part of this. So they don't validate your intent, what you're trying to achieve against what's actually there. And of course, it's still vendor specific uh, and the details matter. So I think the fundamental problem that we have is that we're taking a bottom-up approach to a top-level problem. We're taking the view of we write an assembly language, it's a pain to write different variants for all these different machines, so we write a script that basically spits out this assembly language with sort of syntactic changes to adapt to what the different switches should be told. So the top-down approach, which is what we think you obviously should take is you want the self-operating network. You want to say, what do I need to operate my network? Well, there's this concept I love in computing, which is the operating system. <laughs> And, you know, an operating system operates a computer and it takes care of all sorts of things, manages all the devices and so on. So we should have a network operating system that operates the network for you. And what do you want? Well, you want to be taken out of the loop because it's your time, which is the most expensive element. The OPEX cost of operating a network is a big deal. So you'd say, how do I get out of the loop? Well, I'd like to be able to have this operating system run my network as I intend verify it's running as intended, call me out when uh, he can't satisfy that intent, and then check for mistakes when I do take control. So you free up your brain for more important things. So what is intent-based programming? You declare what you want rather than how to achieve it. So you say, I want a layer three class network and I'm gonna use 32 port TORs and 64 port spine switches and I'm trying to serve this many server ports with at most 75% over subscription and just generate the configurations that do that. Just compile it down to the low level assembly language that achieves that. But then you say, well, also, given you can do that, why don't you show me what it looks like if I use this 48 port switch from this other vendor to see if I can compare the two? I mean, you do this all the time in high level language. I compile it for this architecture, compile it for that one, and see how they compare. So you basically just tell the network operating system your intent, let it figure out how to deliver this with all the vendor specific details. So, how is this intent realized? Well, the operating system just compiles your intent into specific instructions for cabling, for the CLI configuration for each switch, 
but taking into account which vendor it is, just like device drivers do in an operating system, and generate what you need for telemetry to have a closed loop verification your intent is being achieved in an ongoing basis, not just when you first deploy it, but if some device is having a problem or somebody messes with the configuration that detects it. So the operating system, again, is runtime that ensures that each device is and remains cabled correctly, is running the right configuration, and is reporting the telemetry that's matching your intent. So you specify the intent, that is, this is what I want, it takes care of the rest, compiles it, configures it, deploys it, verifies it, and reports back if there's anything that you need to pay attention to. And the key thing is it's liberating your time, your brain, to spend on more important things. So what is intent-based network operating system? Well, it's some degree, it's just the networking world catching up with the rest of the computing industry. So you have this ability to specify things at a much higher level. So you have faster development, greater agility, check mark there. You have automatic error checking at compile time and runtime. Check, you have vendor independence, so you can mix and match best of breed across vendors. A good check mark to have as well. So to me, it's, <laughs> It's not future net, this is partly just catching up with the present in terms of technology and of course being prepared for the future. So, hey, do we really have to go that far? Can't we just use the server configuration tools? Well, some people keep raising that topic. To me, network configuration is network and device specific and it's across many devices and network problems are network specific and may entail interaction between devices. And to me, the way I understand this being Canadian is that servers are like muscle, network is like your nervous system. And if a muscle has a problem, you limp, you reboot it, you, you take it out of service. If your nervous system has a problem, you can't walk, <laughs> never mind run. So don't treat your, you know, treating your network like a server is trying to like treating your brain like a muscle. You know, you just don't want to be a knucklehead about it. These are very different systems. The network is the foundation. So what about orchestration? Well, to me, orchestration is a fancy term for configuration, but it doesn't tend to have an integrated closed loop. So it's like having a conductor who can't hear the music. That is, he's waving his arms, telling everybody what to do, but he can't hear what's actually going on. This doesn't work with music, and it's not going to work with your network. So just having the orchestration portion isn't enough. Intent, which is, says, this is what I want, allows the system to say, okay, I'll check that what you want is what's actually going on. And you can generate that automatically. That is, you close that loop. So to me, you want to face the music and say, I'm insisting on this being closed loop. I don't want a deaf conductor sort of orchestrating my network. So another approach is to say, well, I got all this CLI stuff, you know, why don't I have sort of a network lint type program in analogy to what we've used in, in the software world, some program analysis tools that sniff over my CLIs and see what's going on. Well, this is basically where you can reverse, try and reverse engineer your intent from the CLI conf configs. Well, in theory, this allows you to work with your existing networks, and in theory, this allows you to keep all your legacy CLI configs and scripts, and in theory, your network operations can keep doing what they're doing, so it's kind of a one small step for network operations, and seems appealing from that standpoint. However, I claim that reverse is a bad way to go forward because in practice, reverse engineering is hard and we've had experience in the software world with this. A lot of tools that have been built for C and C++ and other languages have real trouble trying to figure out where there's problems in this. So it's hard to catch all the problems, especially we have this problem that we're vendor specific, so there's slight differences to, uh, hard to catch. And it's hard to deal with complex configurations that you actually get get in practice, which are not necessarily consistent or in many cases are very inconsistent and it's hard to avoid a plague of false positives. And that's one of the things we've learned in the software world is these tools, these analysis tools can announce all sorts of problems which you spend time looking into, again, manual work, 
um, and they don't turn out to be real, real problems. And of course, doing these tools doesn't avoid the need to manually set up these configurations, manually have people that understand these, all these problems. So to me, this reverse engineering approach is at best a necessary evil for legacy networks. In contrast, this forward direction of saying I start from intent, I'm going to generate the configurations that are correct by construction. So I don't have to ask what their intent is. I don't have to ask if they're correct. They've been correct by construction and then they're validated in real time. So this eliminates all this manual change overhead and it eliminates the vendor specific dependency. So my claim is that it's a bigger step to go to intention based networking but can't let legacy drive your strategy. You have to say, what is the outcome I want? The outcome you want is to reduce my OPEX cost, improve my agility, improve my reliability, and taking a top-down approach is much more effective. <clears throat> So isn't this ISDN all over again? Well, yes and no. Uh, yes, it's about uh, opening up the network to allow programming. No, SDN in its original form was really focused on control plane. Intent base is really at the management level and that's where the cost is incurred. That's what you need to solve. So I claim that SDN was the right problem but the wrong answer in its original form. The intent based network operating system is the right answer to the right problem. So, um, so how real is this? I mean, we're here at FutureNet. Is this waiting for Buck Rogers to show up? Well, Gardner says it's real. This is the next big transition in networking. Cisco says it's real. It claims it's got product shipping and more to come. Our company, Appstra, says it's real. We have AOS. It's our product is shipping, and there's more to come on there. And I think VMware must think it's real. They invited me here. So I claim. <laughs> The train has left the station already, so are you on board? So who else has automated their networks? Well, the list is actually Google, Amazon Web Services, Facebook, Azure, and so on. All the public cloud providers have this advantage over you because they've invested significantly in automation. My view, we're in the situation where it's automation or obliteration. And we're, I think what we're seeing is this trend with Appstra and others providing this automation outside of these public cloud providers. So can I trust this? Well, I think empirically it's far better than manual. As you get this software deployed over many networks, it's tested over many networks, and of course, so you can rely on this as much as you rely on Linux and so on, unless of course you try and write the software yourself. And of course the closed loop verification ensuring that the network does match your intent in any case. So my claim is a bigger lift, risk in being left behind than being on board here. So who cares about this? Well, I claim end users care. It's going to reduce outages, provide greater agility, uh, reduce the time to market on things, improve reliability. Of course, the CFO is going to love this because it reduces uh, OPEX cost, CAPEX cost, and so on. And the network infrastructure team, most people say, well, you can put these guys out of jobs. Well, what we've seen is they're overworked with stupid stuff, and they're not able to pay attention to the smart stuff. And so we want allow them to work more on strategic stuff and respond faster to important requirements. So how do I get started? Well, this is automation. Uh, I made up a quote for Peter Drucker here, which is that automation is this process of converging and balancing between what your people do and what the computers can do. And so the sooner you realize, readjust that balance, the sooner you understand how to do it and do it. I think there's a bunch of baby steps. We're involved in proof of concept trials and deployments and green patches is a term somebody's used here as well. So the important thing, I think, is to get started here. So what should I look for here in, in an intent-based network operating system? Well, you should be able to specify this high-level intent. It should provide closed-loop verification. It should provide this vendor agnostic independent operation. What else? Well, you want extensibility because most of your requirements are actually similar to others, but there's a few unique ones. So you want this ability to extend it yourself. You don't want to be locked into another black box at the network operating system level any more than you were at the switch level. So extensibility, I claim, means owning your own network roadmap. You also clearly want scalability and, uh, you know, Scaling is a non-trivial challenge. Telemetry for a large number of devices is a demanding load. 
So you want to ha have a distributed system that scales up as you run it across more servers, that has replication as you scale up. So if it does not scale, you're going to fail here because all of these clouds, private clouds and so on, are scaling up. So AOS is the thing that we've developed, which is a distributed intent-based vendor agnostic network operating system. Its objective is to operate your network. It provides closed loop. It provides this extensibility. And its core, it's a distributed system, which is my technical expertise. Uh, and so it achieves the scalability that way. Some of the customer experience we've had, somebody says, well, we're going to use OSPF for something because we thought BGP was hard to configure, but when we used AOS, it did the configuration for us. Or another case, somebody said, we wanted to use vendor Y, and so did the CFO, but our network engineers only knew vendor X. So AOS, again, just papered over those differences, so we operate the level of what we intend for the network. If AOS handles these vendor differences. Another customer said, you know, we've allocated months to stand up a new pod and weeks to make configuration changes in AOA's auto. I did this down to minutes. And you get the confidence in making these changes because they're correct by construction and checked against your intent. So in conclusion, I'd say I think the future is intent-based networking. And in sense, you know, how do you get any further than that? Because the network can't do what you want unless it knows what you want and intent is how you express this. But, of course, I claim this is happening now, not <laughs> years from now. And you might say, well, wait a minute, I can't do this because I have to retrain my people. Well, the reality is network engineers know their intent. They know what you intend to accomplish with this network, so they don't have to be trained to intent. They just have to have something they can express that intent to rather than encoding it down to this level of assembly language programming. So I claim the OPEX and the CAPEX benefits are so compelling that you really can't sit on the sidelines at this point, and the pain of changing is far less than the pain of being left behind. So the future is now. Thanks very much. <clears throat>